The heroes of faith aren't spectators watching us from heaven. Rather, they are a, a true living example of how they overcame and how we can too. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Lord, we just thank you for this time that we can share this word with you. Lord, as we continue striving towards our home, our eternal inheritance, we ask that you give us the strength, the endurance, the patience, and the courage to have that race of faith, to continue seeking your face, seeking your face, the kingdom of God, so that all of your righteousness shall be added unto us. And Lord, we, we send this message out to those that have eyes and ears to hear and see, and ask that your good and pleasing will be known. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so after we spoke about how we need to ensure that we can continue in the faith through yesterday's message, having faith just like the just ones as of old. We go into today speaking of that race and sharing some scriptures about the race of faith and how we can continue going in deeper, stronger and eternally with love so that we can overcome all the things that are not of God and all the challenges that we face in our in our daily lives, whether it's illness or persecution or trials or tribulations. We know that the Lord is with us always. I want to open up in Colossians. If we uh, turn our attention to the first passage of Scripture, which is taken from Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through to 11. Speaking of not carnality, but Christ. And I'm going to read just a few verses and I'll let you read the rest. And I'll take it from Colossians chapter 3, verses 8 through to 11. Now, this is after saying that once we raised with Christ and we are seeking those things are, that are above, we are in Christ sitting with him in all things. And then in verse 8, it says, But now you yourselves are put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with its deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is in all and all in all. A great way to open up our passage of scripture saying that uh, his desire for all of us to be saved is his primary focus because it's that eternal relationship that he wants to have with us. But Paul in this passage demonstrates the life-changing power of the gospel that's equal, equally as important as uh, the defending it against error and uh, strain. If we want our relationship with our Lord to grow, we need to stay in the word and continue pressing in, pressing onwards. Colossians, able to fulfill the command of the daily displaying and the attention affection towards the spiritual things. See things from above, not below. And when we have that God perspective on how he sees things, we may be able to bring that down into where we're living in today. Understanding that he's a good, good father and he's always faithful to us. And when we identify this through the, the death of, of Christ and the past that has uh, shown us the way, it gives us the empowerment of that resurrected Christ who has come not only to save lives, but to bring them into the full eternal reality. But the focus and the interest and the ambition is heavenward, which entails a casting away of specific devices, whether it's sensual, self-indulgences, attitude, speech, prejudice, or anything of that, of that kind, cultivating something more eternal the virtuous values, the relationship and the worship that we have with our Lord. So as we open up with that passage of scripture, I'd like to then go to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. And this is now speaking of that race of faith. And if we read the first two verses, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, every sin, which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
So remember a couple of messages ago, you know, we've got all these things left, right, right, wrong, uh, you know, all these things that are coming against us, information and uh, truth and error. But we, where are we looking? We need to be looking up like Habakkuk in the last message, you know, asking God these questions and waiting on him for the answer and being patient and knowing that his will be fulfilled and what is placed on our hearts will come to pass. We just need to be patient. Now, there's a word wealth that we can uh, appreciate and learn from. Word wealth, Strong's Accordance 872, from apo, which is away from, and horeo, which is to see. The word signifies undivided attention, looking away from all the distractions in order to fix one's gaze on the object. Aphorio, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2, is having eyes for no one but Jesus. So when we keep our eyes fixed on him, that wave or waves that are plaguing us, they don't seem as big as what we would see them as if we're busy looking at them. Just like Peter when Jesus said, come. Now appreciating these things, we do live in a world that is fallen and we, you know, Jesus, Jesus didn't deny the, the reality of the problem. He just knew where his faith was and that was with God. And that's an encouraging word for us all during the season, especially with all these things that are happening worldwide, nationally, locally. It's really, you know, testing our faith. And uh, that's something that we've got to be sure of. We've got to make sure that we're standing on the rock, standing on the rock. And when we are looking up and looking at the one who is the author and the finish of our salvation, we can appreciate what Jesus did when he ascended into heaven. And if we go back to Luke, uh, Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, verses 49 through to 53. So this is when he opened the scriptures and uh, the words that he had spoken to the disciples. And he was still with them. Things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. This is what Jesus was saying. Then he opened the understandings that they might comprehend the scriptures. But he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And the repentance and the remission of sins could be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. What a wonderful testimony. What a wonderful instruction. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endured with power from on high. This was his uh, departing message to his disciples as he knew what was going to be lying before him. And when he opened the scriptures and spoke to them in these words, he, he spoke to them and promised them the power that would come from on high. And that's a kingdom dynamic that we can appreciate these days. Speaking of the Holy Spirit's fullness, Jesus' instructions to the, the disciples before his ascension were clear. Wait in Jerusalem and expect power. There was no hint given about what would happen, but clearly the evidence shows that Jesus knew what would occur and what would make it abundantly clear to them. The promise of my Father and all they experienced at the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost are one and the same. As the baptizer with the Holy Spirit, Jesus' instruction to his followers in chapter 11 verses 13 is to ask for the Holy Spirit and to wait until they receive power is pertinent to all believers of all times. All who believe are to ask and expect God to fill them with his Holy Spirit and to be empowered for their mission to serve him. It is supernatural power, not ordinary power, that Jesus uses to fill, fulfill his mission to the world through his church. And as we continue to appreciate that truth, it gives us a new revelation of what Christ has in and through us. Building, he's building his church and the gates of Hades will not prevail. So that gives us the assurance that we continue taking steps, advancing his kingdom, sharing his love, sharing the hope that people need in this time. Now, if we go to Acts, we looked the other day at Acts and how uh, the Lord spoke not only to Jesus and through Jesus to the disciples, but when we turn our attention to Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, when Jesus ascended to heaven, which is coming up this uh, week in a, in, a few, in a few days' time, and I'm giving you a bit of a, a, a taste as to what you can open up, where you can open up the scriptures, so that you can appreciate all the things that had come to pass, had been fulfilled. 
And in Acts chapter 1, uh, verses 9 through to 11, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards the heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This is the same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will also come in like a manner as you saw him go into heaven. So he's going to come back just as he went into heaven. He's going to come back and fulfill his uh, promise that he's going to come back for his bride. So what do we do in the meantime? We make sure that we get into the word, learn the word ourselves, equip ourselves and each other, look out for each other, share a, 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 a word of encouragement or a word of wisdom or a word of warning. That's about looking after his bride, making sure that we all get there without the spots and wrinkles and we walk, going towards the promised land. And as we enter the promised land, we can give thanks for what he has done because he gets the glory, not us. You know, this passage of scripture reminds me of Daniel when he was speaking of these things back in the Old Testament. And it was quite a prophetic time where Daniel was speaking and he was making sure that people were hearing what was to happen. And in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 to 14, it speaks of the vision of the ancient days. Now God's sovereignty over the kings is seen here by plucking out three of the first horns. And dispensational interpretation also sees this fourth kingdom as Rome. But what were the others regarded as? So I'll let you read through Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 through to 14. But I will read verses 13 and 14. I was watching in the night's vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the cloud of heaven, he came to the ancient days, and he brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So we know that there's rises and falling of kingdoms, and there's certainly some kingdoms that are not of God. But we know through this promise and through the scripture that Daniel wrote so, so many years ago, that that will come to pass. There will be a kingdom that will stand, and that is God's kingdom, that will overrule, overpower, and give more substance to the shadow. So let's be encouraged with that. Even though God uses wicked men. We just appreciate that he will continue to do a good work in and through us. But the ancient days of God, or the ancient days is God, indicating his eternal uh, redemptive plan, his throne that overrules all other thrones. No other throne will go above him. He reigns it above, above it all. And from it proceeds the fire of judgment. And that's something that is a time where God brings that about. Daniel's dream is in part messianic, which uh, is announcing the Messiah's coming and will inaugurate a new phase in God's rule and design, as well as the experience. And we want to partner with that because we want to see things from heaven's point of view. And there's so many things that are uh, seeking our attention from this earthly, uh, carnal, fleshly world that we live in. Knowing that he's coming back, and we don't know the hour that he's coming back, but by the looks of all things happening, it doesn't seem to be too far away. But it also gives us a hope and a future that he promised back in Jeremiah. But what do we do while we wait? We call to occupy. We call to stand in the gap. We call to share the message till the end of the age so that he may be able to be glorified in all things. Glorified in all things in the end of the age comes in a couple of uh, areas, which includes revelation. Now, this is something we're going to be spending a season in. But I just want to uh, give you an introduction that the revelation, the book of Revelation, may be a very difficult book to understand and appreciate and may be seen as, as a very harsh book. But actually, if you read it, it shows the, the complete love of Christ in all things that he does in and through his saints and disciples. And through the Holy Spirit that he says he's going to send upon high. 
to appreciate, appreciate right from the beginning, right to the end of the book, is that inside of the beginning from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, his story is known to all nations and those that are radically transformed through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God may rise and build their lives on the Word of God and build the future generations. Let's turn our attention to give you some encouragement as to what it says at the end of Revelation, which is a, a wonderful promise. Because it says all things will be made new. And if we read the first uh, few verses, let's, let's read 1 to 8. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his disciples. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. And there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give a fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But then there's a warning. The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, abominable murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. So while he's giving us the promise and the faithful promise, he's also warning us not to turn away from him, even when there's tough times, but also renewing ourselves. Because if you've lived a lifestyle of these things that are mentioned in verses 8, there's an opportunity for us to turn back to him and then let go of those ways and also appreciate that he will work in and through us all in his time, bringing us to the the bride that he's wanting to prepare to take home with him. There's two word wells that I want to go into, which is this preparation. We speak of heaven. We speak of the divine realm, um, God of love. And heaven in Strong's Accordance 3772 is to compare. It's a urinography and Uranus, a word often used in the plural to denote the sky and the rains above the earth and the abode of God, Christ, angels and resurrected saints. By metonymy, the word means and refers to God and to the inhabitants of heaven. So as we read these, there's so many scriptures in that little word wealth that I wish I could share with you. But I, for the sake of our time together, and for the sake of, um, you know, just focusing on the verses that we're going to be putting on the description at the bottom, I'd like to encourage you to go into the Word of God, read around this passage of Scripture, so that you can understand that at the end of the book, it all is going to turn out well. But we've got to prepare ourselves. And this is the, the next word wealth that I want to go into. Strong's Accordance 2090. To make ready, prepare, make arrangements, in addition to its normal use describing preparation for coming events, the word is used for preparation of the Messiah, of blessings that God has ordained, and judgment. So while we continue to grow ourselves, let's uh, you know let go of those things that it mentions in, in verses 8. Hold on to what is true, what is faithful, who is true and who is faithful, so that our reward is eternal, not temporary knowing that we still need to stand in these days, making a difference where we can, seeking those lost souls, no matter where they are in terms of leadership. And I say that with the most sincere heart, as they continue to make decisions at a global level, 
with n not no authority of men and women. But we pray that the Lord will radically intercede and, and intervene in their decision-making process, in their destructive and evil ways. And we ask that the Lord turn their hearts back to Him. Because for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son to come into this world that whoever believes in Him may be saved. He came into the world not to condemn the world, but that all may be saved. That includes every single person breathing yeah, the oxygen that he gave us freely. This new earth, this new earth that John describes is the future, the eternal dwelling place of the saints in terms of a holy city, Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. But the holy city is the bride of Christ. It's you and me. It's the church. It's the saints. It's us all. And it mentions tabernacles because in the Old Testament he wanted to tabernacle with us. And he still does. He wants to tabernacle with us every single day. The earthly and the heavenly. A description of the bliss of, of his saints having unbroken fellowship with him. Between God and his people in the Old Testament. But for, available for us all. Knowing that we divide the word of God correctly. So that we can appreciate truth from error. But because of his presence and his love for us, there is no more sorrow. So, loved ones that have gone home to be with the Lord, we mourn their physical loss, but we celebrate their eternal victory. And that may be a message for someone out there who is still mourning their loved one. Have faith, have confidence, filled with hope and love, that that one that you love is eternally being looked after. And if we allow that process of grieving to naturally take its course with the help of the Holy Spirit. This may give us the opportunity to be healed from the inside out. But knowing that those that we love or have lost are in God's hands. God proclaims the completion of the new as well as the destruction of the old. So he says in the word, he's, going to destroy, he's, he's destroying the old and bringing in the new. So that we can reign under the Lordship of our Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you, Jesus Christ, are Lord. And no, nothing will stop him building his church. The gates of Hades will not prevail. But while we continue, we do this with courage and patience, through endurance and the indispensable love that we have for our Heavenly Father. This is a conflict between the lamb and the dragon. And then the option is yours to choose who you will partner with. Who are you going to believe in? Are you going to believe in the lamb? Or are you going to believe in the dragon? We've spoken previously about the unbelief in people's hearts and minds and spirits. And that caused them to continue traveling in the wilderness. Not getting through to the holy land, the promised land that God promised them. Notwithstanding the fact that even those Old Testament saints laid the pathway for us to continue going towards the promised land, setting that, 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 uh, that direction, that direction, that path that perhaps some of them didn't get to themselves and others did, bringing in that beautiful restorative process, even though they slowed to face the giants. Even Joshua, you know, he was a man called by God to bring about change and for good. What about even Josiah? I learned the other day that the word Josiah has a meaning which is similar to a hen. And then that made me reflect on Jesus, how he wept, wept over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long to gather you know, the, all the chicks as a hen does under the, her wings. But you did not listen. But we have an opportunity to hear. And we have an opportunity to turn around and give him our hearts before he comes again. It talks about sorcerers and the literal Greek meaning of this refers to those dealing in drugs. So those dealing in drugs don't have the best interest and intent for those that they are giving it to or selling it to or uh, agreeing to it. And in this passage of scripture that speaks of sorcerers, it's those who 
uh, deviate from the truth and join the deceivers in their wicked agenda and those that uh, want to kill, steal and destroy. So as it was written in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, where in chapter 30, where he said, I'll give you the choice of life and death. Choose life. This is an example of what they said back in the Old Testament, that we, what we can appreciate even today. Are you choosing the lamb or are you choosing the dragon? But as it says, choose wisely. So what happens when we do? walk away, turn away, uh, apostate or fall into these other areas of uh, partnering with things that may not be good, not for us, not for others, not for the community or nation. God said, repent, turn your hearts back to me and I'll heal your land in 2 Corinthians. But if we don't, there's unfortunate consequences that happen. Now, look, we know that there's um, certain things that are, or certain people that are wanting to be like God. But they will never be God because no one can attain to the perfect nature and will of our God. So what they try and do is bring in things that are not good for people. And whether that's through weather, food, medicine that's not good we got to take our stand and say no hang on i'm partnering with the lamb here not partnering with the with the dragon now having been through a period of of learning this through my heavenly father knowing that he loves much Sometimes there's things that the Lord does to try and bring us back on course and bring us back into his love. And that, that calls for that uh, loving discipleship, but also the discipline in that discipleship. No one likes uh, discipline when it happens, but after a while it's, you can look back and appreciate that it was there to help us, not to harm us. I'll let you read further on in Hebrews 12, verses 3 to 11, but not assuming that suffering is something that one endures being a result of uh, sin or profession of faith in Christ. We appreciate that even us as believers go through hard times, persecutions, hardships, trials. Far from neglecting them, God shows himself to be a true father, one who cares for lovingly, wants to correct, guide, exhort, encourage. But the administration of love, not through harsh ways, but through love, is the well-being for the one that the Lord wants to correct, to encourage, to equip, to exhort. Instead of being discouraged in these circumstances, we see persecutions as evidences, perhaps of God's love, even though we don't believe that it's of God, bringing them into our spiritual maturity because he can see things that maybe we don't. And as we grow deeper in his love, he shows us more things, both good and bad. And then because of the, the, the love of the Father that he has for us, we want to extend that love to not only our own children, but to all his children from birth right through to death. But God isn't responsible for the suffering that um, the hostile sinners bring upon them. But he's with us all the time. Never leave you nor forsake you. Knowing that God can use the most tragic, unfortunate, adverse circumstances as instruments to accomplish his purpose. So while we go through this crazy time in this world wanting to do good and knowing that we need to be careful how we go about doing these things because we want to do good but we also don't want to fall into the snare i want to read a kingdom dynamic which speaks of uh, types of discipline which comes in three forms and i'm gonna i'm gonna mention the greek words because i believe that this may help those in that area 
to appreciate that the Father loves you. The Father wants good things for you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to exhort you. He wants to equip you. But there's three types of discipline which the Lord has, which is chastisement. In the Greek word, it's padia, P-A-I-D-E-I-A. Excuse my pronunciation. I need to take a Greek language lesson. But that's to instruct. That's to instruct us so that we can be guided on the right path. Rebuke. We mentioned it the other day when I was... Uh, Speaking of those that want to harm God's children, saying, may the Lord rebuke you, because I can't rebuke them. I'm, I'm just a, a child of God. But the Greek word spelled E-L-E-G-C-H-O, elecho, which is to verbally reprove. And scourges, which the Greek word is spelt M-A-S-T-I-G-O-O, -O, which is mastejo. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, in a physical sense, to correct. Not to beat, not to cause harm, but just to correct physically. Being one filled with instruction prior to that. Now, Knowing that the Lord loves us very, very much. And knowing that we want to do things to honor His name. We do so by wanting to honor each other at the same time. So my encouragement for you is, especially when you're going into the scriptures, getting yourself equipped. Find yourself a leader, an elder in the church that can guide and help and exhort you, correct you. Because that's where we are in a safe place. Because... In counsel, there's wisdom and there's safety. So when you appreciate the difficulties that life brings, get in touch with someone who is further advanced in the gospel and discipleship than yourself, whether it be an elder or a leader, and speak to them about these things because it's your eternal destination as well as the body of Christ that we want to be bring into glory for his name's sake. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 to 17, tells us that, you know, these things don't last forever. But they do bring that spiritual maturity. But there's one better than that. Once we have that growing spiritual maturity, maturity we have that vitality that comes with it. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 to 17, it speaks of renewing the vitality. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up could cause trouble and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator, profane person like Esau, for who one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected and found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. This world is a world full of conflict, and one that is uh, going against the peacemaking that we spoke of in the last message, the peacekeeping that we want to bring. Not to the expense of holiness. Now, as in the account of Esau and Jacob, there was that, that challenge where Esau sacrificed a birthright as an um, unbeknown thing at the time. But I want to encourage us all here today is that you, regardless of the circumstances that we're in, the enemy wants to come and kill, steal, and destroy. But if we work in unity in the body of Christ, working together, looking out for each other, standing in the gap. When one is ill, hold them, pray for them, pray healing over their body, exercise what we've been asked to do by the Lord. If it's not in person, it's behind a closed door. And ask that the Lord will continue to protect them, guard them, heal them, bring them into the place of full restoration, like that bone that we spoke of a couple of weeks ago that was out of joint, 
but mended. We appreciate that this is part of arms God, the God's army and also his saints that wants to do the good and pleasing will of the Father. Remembering that, that those saints that aren't idle spectators, but are active examples of how they overcame. So when we renew our, con, uh, our, our, our spiritual vitality, giving us that peace that surpasses all understanding, even though in the most uh, difficult circumstances, we can watch one another with care. We can look out for one another to make sure that we have the faith secured. Because we don't want anyone to be leaving the faith. We want people to be equipped, strengthened, encouraged, and going deep in their relationship with the Lord. But the root of bitterness was also mentioned in this passage. And that's something very, very important to, to speak of. Because that deliberate uh, turning away from God or a, a, a bitterness that grows between one and another can cause a, a certain defilement. You may not see the bone that's broken. But you may see the spirit that may be broken. In which case we need to guard our mouths. We, we know that the word brings life or death. And we know that the Lord will also correct areas where things have gone wrong. And another encouragement is that spiritual blessing that we have, that vitality that we grow in, is not worth anything that is uh, available for us. In immediate gratification we need to hold fast to the spiritual vitality that we have to have brotherly love what does that mean we'll come to that in the next session now we can talk about that just now talk about it just now a little bit later on it speaks of the glorious company for you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that is burnt with fire and to the blackness and darkness and, temp and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of the word, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as the beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying as was the sight of Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling, but you have come to Mount Zion and, and to the city of the living God and heavenly Jerusalem to innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God the judge of all to the spirit of the just man made perfect to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel it's a wonderful passage of scripture that really allows the writer to present another dramatic contrast which uh, goes into the uh, Judaism and uh, Pictured at Mount Sinai, the Christianity represented at Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. The old covenant of the law brought fear and separation. However, the new covenant brings overwhelming blessings. Let's just repeat that truth. The old covenant of the law brought fear and separation. But the new covenant brings overwhelming blessings. That's the choice. Fear or blessings? So my prayer is that we hear the, the heavenly voice. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Whose voice they then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now, this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. As of the things that are made and the things which cannot be shaken in, uh, may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. The importance of that message leads us into that repentance. It, lead us, it leads us into that restoration. It leads us back into his loving arms. And Hebrews chapter 13 gives us this instruction of concluding moral directions, which is walking in brotherly love. Let brotherly love continue. Brotherly love is uh, from Strong's Accordance 5360, from phileo to love. And Adolphos, which is brother. 
The word denotes the love of brothers and fraternal affection. In the New Testament, it describes the love of a Christian that has for another Christian. That's a believer with a believer. Even those that don't believe, we know that the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, works through each and every single one of us. So when we continue reading this conclusion of the religious directions, we know that it's not about religion, it's about relationship. Because the same Christ who sustained the leaders will support them. And one of the chief causes of the instability of faith is the false and novel teaching. There's the doctrines, which is plural. In Colossians 2 verses 22, it speaks of the doctrine of men, the perishable doctrine, which we need to be careful of. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1, it speaks of the doctrine of demons being deceived. So we need to rightly divide the word of truth, because truth is always in the singular. John 7 verses 17 speaks of doing his will concerning the doctrine. Romans 16 verses 17 speaks of avoiding divisions and offenses. 1 Timothy 4 verses 16 speaks of our personal life as we are purified in the doctrine, the heavenly doctrine. And 2 John verses 9 speaks of us abiding in this doctrine. And when we abide in this doctrine, we can abide in a place of peace, security, love, and knowledge. From head knowledge to heart knowledge, that He is with us every single step of the way. Because faith comes from the heart, it doesn't come from the mind. But we know we need to renew the mind in Christ Jesus. So that by renewing of our minds, thinking of things above and not below, allows Him to show us things that are above from God's perspective, which then starts impacting and radically transforming our nature, our heart, as well as our lives, bringing disease into a place of ease. But we appreciate this fullness of God's grace in the passage of Romans chapter 10, verses 10. As to experience of myself and many others that I've spoken to, loyalty to Christ may bring loss of friends and sometimes even family. But we know that the love of Christ is working in and through each and every single one of us, bringing us back into his redemptive plan and restorative plan. The result of departing from the earthly things, restoring us back into the eternal things allows us to continue looking towards the eternal city, the eternal city to come. Let's offer our sacrifices and our adoration in praise. When we sacrifice, we come into his presence with praise and worship, giving us the opportunity to receive that loving service to others. Freely receive, freely give. But there's a sacrifice of praise. This falls under praise and worship. Why is praising God a sacrifice? The word sacrifice, Greek, thusia, comes from the root theo, a verb meaning to kill or slaughter for a purpose. Praise often requires that we kill our pride, our fear and our sloth. Anything that threatens to diminish or interfere with our worship of the Lord. We also discover here the basics of all our praises, the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by him, in him, with him, to him, and for him, and from him, that we offer our sacrifices and praises to God. Why I say from him is because we're seated in heavenly places. So while we continue striving and doing things for the kingdom of God, we're not doing it for his approval. We're doing it from a place of approval because we are adopted. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. Every single one of us. <laughs> Whether you believe it or not, that's God's love for us all. Praise will never be successfully hindered when we keep its focus on Him. The founder and completer of our salvation. His cross, His blood, His love gift of life and forgiveness to us let's keep praising as a living sacrifice because he is the founder 
And if we understand and appreciate coming under him as the founder, not only of heaven and earth, but of our souls and spirits, we can appreciate the founding of his love and adoration for us. So we can walk and step into that truth. The last message we spoke about the heroes in faith, those that went before us in the Old Testament, Moses and Abraham and all those good people, even the ones that went into the promised land, Joshua, Caleb and all the others, David, King David. But as we remember them, let's also remember the church leaders, those who have gone before us in this day and age, who have been the pillar, not only for the, the, the church of God, but also the community where they've been able to come to, get healing, be restored, be equipped and discipled. God still grows his church, but he uses each and every single one of us in ways that is fitting to the body of Christ, as found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So let's, re let's remember all those leaders, all those elders, all those ministers, all those pastors, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers, the apostles. Let's remember them because they're calling is for your benefit. As then, as it is now, the duties that is uh, presented to those in eldership, leadership, fivefold ministries, providing spiritual oversight and nourishment to the congregation, looking out for them. And obedience denotes an, a, a, a giving someone the opportunity to, spiritually speaking, to our lives for direction. And submission here is yielding to maybe one that may have a different opinion to you, but knowing that in brothers and sisters in Christ, we are called to be able to talk about these things and put our views forward and, and, and share what the Lord is saying to us. Now, in closing of this message, there's so many more things that I'd like to share with you, but this doesn't mean that we need to be blind in our, the unquestioning obedience to everything that leaders say, especially when it comes to the, the integrity and the sovereignty of our bodies, minds, and spirits. The New Testament is um, teaching the, the, the necessity for discernment. Test the spirit. Do not believe every spirit. Because we've got a personal accountability to God, which is giving an account to Him, ourselves, to Him on that day when we meet Him. Bearing our own load, but each other's load, so that we can share the burden as Moses did when he called the 70. Having the mutual submission, being kind and affectionate to one another, knowing that they are going through things in their own lives and bringing the love of Christ into the situation. Having that liberty and love and service for one another gives us that great opportunity to represent Christ. Knowing that we can fear God, but in fearing God that brings us into that restorative place of adoration for him and let's look out for the interest of each other each other's well-being church leaders well some most church leaders aren't autocratic leaders and chiefs who lord it over their congregation but servants of the most high who exercise authority with concern and care so when we appreciate that we've got someone caring for us, someone loving us, they want the best for us, they want the, the, the best out, outcome, not only for our personal, family, community situation, but for, for nations. Sometimes we don't appreciate what the efforts are being made behind the scenes, which doesn't need to go to the elders' glorification because it goes to God's. But God loves each and every single one of us. And he puts us in a position of care, trust, and stewardship. We exhort each other. We give, we lead with mercy, and also with cheerfulness, recognizing the laborers of those who love, laborers of love, and who are in the Lord. Ruling with care, as a shepherd does, because they love the church of God. Giving double honor, especially those to labor 
in word and doctrine. So as we close off the passage of Hebrews, or the book of Hebrews, it speaks of the prayer request. And I'll close off with this. Pray for us that we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. He's saying to them that he wants to be restored to them, but there's a space, a time, and a season that the Lord allows. And that goes then on to the benediction, the final exhortation, and the farewell. Now may the Lord God of peace, who brought upon our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then it goes on to say that he appears to them, or appeals to them, bear with one another of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. So as we close off today, I just want to uh, encourage us to remember a couple of things. Remember the spiritual blessing that's been spoken over your life and prayed over your life, whether it's with you or behind a closed door. That's through prayer and intercession. And God will bring everything about according to his purposes and his will. And he's got a need and a purpose that will fill you in every spiritual sense and well-being through the atoning work of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Because the covenant that he inaugurated is an eternal covenant. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We just ask, firstly, that this message is heard with spiritual ears and seen with spiritual eyes for the love that you have for each and every one of us. You love us so dearly that you want to keep us safe from harm, protect us, nurture us, encourage us, equip us. Let us do great things for you, Lord. But Lord, as it says in this message, let's hold fast to the truth that we can run the race of faith well, knowing that you're a good, good father and you have the best intentions for us always. Lead those that are far from you or hurting or grieving. Bring them into your holy presence. Show them great and wonderful things, not by might, not by power, but by your Holy Spirit, as you've shown all the other saints, the leaders, the elders, and us individually. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for what you did, your Son did on, on the cross for us, so that we may have forgiveness. Because when one forgives much, one loves much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Sending you love. Stay strong. Let's continue going in that race of faith. Take care.